Hi, everyone. Um, I just have to say I've been smiling a lot through these presentations, not just hearing the awesome stories that have been shared, um, but also I think it's very representative of my, um, kind of my aesthetic. I always joke with my lab mates that my personality is very like black and white times New Roman. So naturally, my presentation is black and white times New Roman. Uh, so, um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. And a lot of things have really resonated with me um, that have been said before. Kind of this idea of taking a leap of faith and then also, you know, things not appearing how they should, have, like how we think they appear, how, you know, our lives being linear. And I think that's um, a really key part of my story too. Um, if you look at my, my journey, in my, you know, I can tell a story that's very linear, but in reality, it's kind of been all over the place and not always what you can see on the outside. Um, so yeah, as a kid, I often felt like very frustrated with how my mind worked. Um, no matter how hard I tried, my brain never really functioned the way it seemed like my friends did. Um, in honor of football weekend, um, to use a football metaphor, I felt like uh, the players were like shouting at me from the sidelines telling me plays, but like the coach just forgot to tell me what the plays were. Um, so, like, you know, even though, like, on the outside, I've always appeared to look like my friends and my peers, um, I always felt like it kind of took me double the work to get by the same way that a lot of my friends did. Um, however, when I came to Notre Dame, I learned two lessons that really changed how I viewed the world around me and myself. Um, first, through my coursework in disability studies and um, my, summer learning service, my summer service learning program at a therapeutic day school for kids with autism. Um, I really began to question these ideas of what it means to be normal and what it means to be successful. Um, they're really quite arbitrary concepts. Um, and what I came away from that experience learning was that every single one of us is unique and has really immensely valuable abilities, even if the world around us doesn't tell us that they, are, they seem valuable. Um, every single person deserves to live a meaningful life, and with the right supports, every single person can thrive. Um, so these experiences really sparked my passion for working with individuals with disabilities. Um, and it also inspired my interesting pairing of majors, uh, neuroscience and behavior and English, which is not your typical pairing. So my neuroscience and behavior classes really allowed me to think about how our brains influence how we act, whereas my English major really taught me how we as human beings interact with the world around us and like how our brains interact with our environments. Um, so this kind of led to my second like worldview changing experience at Notre Dame. And that was through uh, Dr. Nancy Michaels' developmental neuroscience class. Um, I email her like every year telling her how much I love this class and how much it changed my life. And she, I'm sure she's tired of hearing from me because it's just such an awesome class and so many people have such great things to say about it. Um, but this class is really unique in that it's both the study of developmental neuroscience and how we can use research in the community to um, build a better kind of society around us and really partner with community leaders and community stakeholders. So through this class, I learned that we can impact how children's brains develop with the right supports, and ultimately, with the right tools, we can maximize each child's potential. So this idea like really revolutionized my life. It was like it completely changed the, tra the trajectory of what I thought I was going to do. So, as a second semester senior, um, I took a really big leap. That was kind of a little crazy at the time. I rescinded my medical school acceptances um, after four years of being on the pre-med track, and instead I decided to just kind of follow my gut and explore the ways that neuroscience, social justice, and um, child-serving systems, like our education systems, child welfare systems, interact to best support um, how kiddos develop. Um, so, again, very nervously, not really having any idea what I'm doing, I suddenly found myself um, as a Teach for America Corps member teaching special education on the south side of Chicago. Um, no formal teaching experience, so it was really quite the adventure. Um, during this process, I was supposed to be teaching math and science, but what I realized very quickly is that I cared far more about the socio-emotional well-being of my students. And I spent a lot of time coming up with like, creative, like socio-emotional activities for them to do in the classroom to help regulate, to keep kids from getting kind of referred out. Um, I noticed that for a lot of my kids, um, these issues were the biggest barriers they faced in the classroom. 
and there was really no access to mental health support for any of my students, aside from the services at schools. Um, and that really got me thinking about how we serve kids and families in our communities and how the school is really a central component of that service model. For so many families, the only place they can get mental health support or physical therapy or occupational therapy is at the school. And that's a huge source of like, service provision for a lot of people, but we don't talk about that. Um, so that really kind of got my mind working. Um, and then to make matters worse, um, a lot of my students and their parents just felt so defeated. I taught freshmen in um, high school, and at that point, they had felt defeated and excluded from so many decisions that actively influenced like their school-based care, not just their special education academic services, but what services they got at school as well, um, like PT and OT and social work. Um, I just noticed that so many people at the school were kind of focusing on like their, their superficial deficits and like what they needed to do to improve their SAT scores or something like that. Um, and they focused so much on what they couldn't do and they just totally overlooked the fact that like with high expectations, high support, the right services and meaningful family partnerships, my students could absolutely thrive. So after leaving the classroom, these experiences kept rolling around in my head. I did some more. I knew I wanted to go to kind of like a more academic route after um, teaching. So I did some more kind of like peer research um, in communities on the south side of Chicago, um, in schools with fifth and sixth graders. And um, I just couldn't help thinking about like we need to be thinking about this through a public health lens. We need to be thinking about how do we deliver services through where our families can access them, which in a lot of cases is the school. So I really desperately wanted to do something to give like parents and children, especially families of color, a seat at the table, um, because I really think that families need to be at the center of determining what access, what services are delivered and how those services are delivered. Um, but my families face so many barriers to even just getting a seat at the table, to even being able to sit down and make those decisions that I didn't even know where to start. So this is where my second big leap of faith came into play. Um, I had been thinking about this a lot, and I wanted to think about how do we build these family um, clinician partnerships? How do we enable parents to share what they need before services even start so that they can be equal members of the team? Um, so I took a big leap of faith. I cold called a professor at Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern and um, who specialized in parenting, and I just had this idea of, well, what if we created this tool that allowed parents and clinicians to discuss what families needed to engage in services before they get to the table? Um, and the thinking was, this way parents would have the opportunities to kind of take a look at what common needs are there, identify, oh yeah, transportation is a barrier, um, understanding special education terms is a barrier, um, before they even get to these meetings, so that way clinicians would understand what their needs were, and then also, providers would be more equipped to um, address these challenges or discuss these challenges to optimally engage parents. Um, I believe that giving parents an opportunity to share their needs at the beginning of the start and even identify needs they didn't know they had, um, clinicians would be able to best support parents in being equal members of their children's special education team, which is a key tenant of special education law, but it's often not followed through. And furthermore, kind of this like family-based like collaborative care model is the foundation of any other care delivery service. If you go to an outpatient physical therapy office, if you go to your pediatrician, in theory, it should be based on this collaborative family-based you know, partnership. Um, but that's not happening at schools, which is a problem since so many kids are only getting their services at schools. Um, so after many hours of collaborating with parents and school-based professionals, um, I finally developed this tool, um, and I'm working right now on putting it online to freely disseminate to parents throughout um, public school systems um, in an easy-to-use online platform. So parents can just enter what, um, take the survey, enter you know what the responses are, and they get a response right away that says, "Okay, these are my top five needs I need to address to be able to have a seat at this table." Um, so this work really led the foundation for all of my future work, um, developing programs, conducting research, delivering care. Um, my focus has always been putting the voices of individuals with disabilities and their families at the centers of treatment, particularly school-based treatment. Um, 
And as a result, this has been such an awesome experience of getting to really build powerful connections in the disability community in the policymaking space. Um, working with, I'm currently working at the Shriners Hospital for Children in Chicago and getting to see how we serve those who don't have access to insurance or access to um, care outside of like these kind of supportive medical institutions. Um, and my ultimate goal is not so much to you know think of new solutions, but it's how do we take, how do we come up with creative solutions to the current systems we already have? We have limited resources as we like in our society as it is. So we need to be creative. We need to be come up with these solutions that navigate these these systems in ways that work for families. So in my work, I strive to elevate the voices of individuals in the disability community, as well as those who support them. Um, I really think that the voice of the individual with the disability needs to be the center, but we have to recognize that that's not often just one person fighting a battle on their own. Parents need to be included, family members, aunts, uncles, teachers. Um, so I work really hard so that children and families with all types of needs and those in their networks can develop these unique solutions to improve mental well-being and to optimize developmental trajectories. Um, so yeah, in light of feeling like I was, like, in, light, in light of um, feeling like my, my brain wasn't always working the way I thought it was supposed to work, I really feel strongly about helping others who feel like their brains or their bodies aren't working the way that they think they should and really flip that narrative to realize that every child can thrive just the way they are. So I'll wrap up with one final thought, um, again, in honor of game day, and uh, kind of as a reference to Notre Dame's classic What Would You Fight For campaign. Um, I used to, I grew up in a Notre Dame family, as many of us here, um, grew up watching Notre Dame football games, and the games were always fun, but my favorite part was always the What Would You Fight For commercials. I thought they were just like so inspirational, and like my dream as a kid was to have my own What Would You Fight For commercial. So um, I'm gonna do my a hybrid version here. Um, so if you were to ask me what I would fight for, it's this. I'm fighting for every person, regardless of ability, to have the tools and support needed to live a happy, happy meaningful life. And I hope you all join me in pushing for this important cause. So thank you.